was worth the hour it took to render. <laughs> so in many ways, Polymer has been a sort of Tesla vehicle for the Chrome team, highlighting one path for how you can ship fast, high-performance progressive web apps that work really, really well on mobile. But we work in a really diverse community, right? Like everyone is using different tech stacks. And today, we wanted to talk a little bit about how you can use other libraries and frameworks like React um, to build you know, fast, progressive web apps. And looking at you know, what, what do you need to do um, in order to, to make things like React qualify to build instant experiences on real devices. Uh, Flipkart are going to get up right after me to talk a little bit about their experience shipping um, React PWAs at scale and all of the lessons that they learned. Um, and we have a little surprise for you at the tail end of this talk that uh, you'll see in a, in a short while. So let's start off with this statement. Frameworks can be fast if we put the work in. I firmly believe this. I think that we're at a point where you know, fast is not the default. For, for a lot of libraries and frameworks. I think that a lot of them, a lot of framework authors acknowledge that you know, we can do better um, when it comes to performance on real world devices. But let's take a look at what's possible today. So this is Flipkart on a real device. They're doing really, really well. They're interactive in just a few seconds. They're shipping just the minimal functional code to get a, rea uh, you know, to get a route um, interactive very, very quickly. They're deferring a lot of the work that's not needed for this route to a, a future point in time. And they're taking advantage of techniques like code splitting and purple in order to accomplish this. Um, Housing.com are similarly doing really great work in this area. Again, they're interactive in just a few seconds. But we talk a lot about speed and, and what it means to be fast um, at CDS. What, what do we actually mean by fast? So there are a few key moments when it comes to modern loading performance. Um, and some of these metrics are things you might be familiar with. So the idea of first paint, first meaningful paint. But really, there are three phases here. There's the, is it happening moment? Is it useful? And is it usable? Now, we're increasingly trying to focus on the, is it usable phase? So time to interactive. So at one point um, during loading, is your app actually engageable by the user? If they tap on different things inside the app, can they actually accomplish things that are useful to them? And time to interactive is really, it's that point when I can tap and I can get something, something useful. Now, we're saying that ideally, you know, if you're, regardless of what it is that you're using to build these apps, um, it'd be great to be interactive in under five seconds on a real device under real representative network conditions, so 3G. Um, if you happen to be using service worker caching, um, you're going to benefit from sort of trying to ideally hit an instant repeat load. And your time to interactivity is going to be even better in those cases. So service worker caching, definitely worth looking at. Um, in this case, there's actually nothing on this person's phone screen. And I think they're going through withdrawal of some <laughs> sort here. So uh, Lighthouse has been mentioned. Darren mentioned it in his keynote. Uh, Lighthouse is currently uh, one of the best ways to uh, easily track things like time to, to interactivity. Um, it includes a number of different performance metrics. This is the Lighthouse extension. It's also available as a CLI. But time to interactive is included inside the performance audits. Um, and if you want to take a look at how well you're doing, what I recommend is trying out Lighthouse over remote debugging. Um, you know, testing it with a real phone. Uh, it'll give you sort of a, an eye-opening look at your performance on real-world devices. So that's definitely worth spending some time on. So recently, I was very curious about how the React community were shipping down code, um, how they were tackling things like module bundling. So I put out this call on Twitter um, asking people, you know, how do you ship React in production, and, and what were your experiences doing that? Um, and I've published a little bit of the data on that, but let's dive into it. So what JavaScript module bundler do you use? The majority of people are using Webpack. Um, this breaks down into sort of 65% of people are using Webpack 1, a smaller number are using Webpack 2, but those numbers are increasing. And the rest of these numbers are sort of browserify and other bits and pieces. So Webpack is kind of a big deal. Let's, let's take that from, from this particular slide. I then asked people if they were using code splitting to chunk up their JavaScript. And I got a very surprising answer. I saw that 58% of people thought that they were. Now, this surprised me, because when I talked to like the Webpack community, when I talked to the Webpack authors, they were like, we don't think that any more than like 10% of people are really using code splitting. Um, and there's something interesting there. Maybe there's a breakdown in terminology. Maybe people are using code splitting, but not necessarily doing it the right way. And I don't kind of blame them, because configuring Webpack um, 
is so fun. It's the best. <laughs> but I think that we have opportunity to improve that. Um, other concepts that people were looking at, so 11% of respondents said that they were exploring service worker support, so that's good. Love to see more people doing that. 14% were looking at HTTP2 and what would, be in, what would in, be involved in sort of granularly shipping stuff down. And 19% were looking at tree shaking, so interesting stats. Now, we mentioned the Polymer shop demo quite a lot. Um, and the reason for that is it's using Purple. It does really, really well on real-world devices under 3G. So on Throttle 3G, this app is interactive in about 4.3 seconds, about four seconds. Um, if, you're, if you're looking at it with like a really, really bad 3G network, so something with, with more packet loss, it's still doing pretty good, 5.8 seconds. We take a look at Flipkart and housing.com next. And Flipkart is in, um, you know, between these two apps, I, I did the averages, and, and they're um, getting interactive in about 4.5 seconds, so still fairly fast, fairly good, about 6.9, you know, with packet loss, but they're still doing pretty well. So these guys are using basically all of the tooling, all of the performance best practices that we're encouraging folks to take a look at um, to ship these experiences down uh, in ways that are going to ideally benefit their users at the end of the day. So here's the crux of, of the study. I ended up profiling um, over 150 React apps that people submitted over the last couple of weeks, read the numbers quite a lot of times, it was fun, so fun, uh, on real devices. And what I discovered was that the average React app in that survey was interactive in about 11 seconds. So there's quite a gap there between what's possible and where the average app is right now. Um, with packet loss, we're looking at 12 seconds. Uh, the, probably the worst app in that particular study was interactive in 24 seconds. So the user is going to be in uncanny valley, just like tapping around the screen and not really seeing anything happening. So this is, this is a sort of a, a timeline trace of, of what the average uh, you know, React app built with Webpack looks like. In this case, um, I saw you know, uh, uh, hundreds of kilobytes of script being shipped down just for a single route. A lot of it wasn't being used. Uh, they are using code splitting, but they're actually, you know, it's taking eight seconds before all of the script and their common chunks are being shipped down. Thousands of seconds are being spent in parse and eval time. And for anyone that sort of followed Paul Lewis and Paul Irish's guidance over the last couple of years about, you know, trying to ship a frame in 16.6 .6 milliseconds, well, these guys have got a frame that lasts 7,973. It's doing really great there. It's great. But we can do better. So first piece of advice is try not to keep the main thread busy. Um, if you are someone that's shipping down really large bundles of JavaScript, um, it's going to take longer to load, parse, execute, and run. It's definitely going to peg the main thread. Now, this advice comes with nuance. Um, and nuance is something we often lack in these conversations. It's really tricky to pack it into a short amount of time. But um, basically, if, if you're working on a page that is not going to be useful to your user in any way unless you ship that amount of script, you're probably better off shipping it. If you can, however, trim that down so that you're just shipping the minimal functional stuff that's going to be useful to your users, please consider doing that. It's going to help them out. Because they're not going to need you shipping like all of the script for the entire site or the entire app in one go. Other things that can impact sort of the main thread being busy and time to interactivity are sort of suboptimal back and forth between the client and the server. Um, Sam Ciccone touched a little bit on the idea of JavaScript parse, compile, and eval execution times being a little bit different um, between desktop devices and mobile. Here we have a meg of script, about 250 kilobytes minified, um, and the amount of time it takes to parse and compile it on what a lot of us, so I see a lot of MacBooks in the room, um, this is how long it takes to sort of parse and execute that on a MacBook Pro from 2015. And take a look at the difference, like how much our assumptions are broken when it comes to the average phone, something like a Moto G. This is taking about three seconds to parse, compile, and, and execute. And that's not even looking at load time. Like if you're trying to get interactive in under five seconds, this is just not going to cut it. But all of this, again, it's got nuance. You need to make sure that you're, you're measuring um, before you're optimizing, but you're, you're ideally trying to make sure you're doing the right thing for users. Test on real phones and real networks. This is something that we've mentioned in a few talks at Chrome Dev Summit. I cannot stress enough how important it is to test on real devices. Emulation is only going to get you so far. You can be testing with you know, 3G throttling on, with CPU throttling on, on desktop. And the difference between that and the stats you will get out of a real phone 
are still gonna be multiple seconds. I think there are opportunities there for us to do better at its fooling level, but you know, real devices have got different mixes of cores, GPU, memory. There's gonna be packet level differences for different networks. So do try to make Chrome inspect your best friend and use it. So when, when Alex Russell you know, carries around all these phones, he's not crazy. Um, Mobile web speeds do kind of matter. Um, in fact, you know, on average, faster experiences tend to lead to, to longer sessions. Um, and one of the, I think it was perhaps the double click, uh, the double click report uh, that recently published said that you know people that did optimize for performance were seeing anywhere up to two times um, mobile ad revenue. So test on real devices, make real money. <laughs> Let's, let's, let's riff on this other idea. So less code loaded better helps everyone. This is another one of those items that requires nuance. But if you're able to load less code up for a route in order to get it useful, please do so. Um, the nuance part comes again from that part of you, you may require more script. Uh, me shipping down 300 kilobytes of script may be very different to someone else doing it. There's going to be different parse and eval times at play there. So again, very important to measure. But let's, let's riff on this idea of less code loaded better. Uh, we're going to use Webpack. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with what Webpack is. For anyone that hasn't used it before, it's basically a popular JavaScript module bundler. It packs lots of modules into smaller bundles so you can ship them down to your users. Um, and so we're going to look at some of these ideas around uh, the purple pattern and how you can serve these things down to your users. The first one is code splitting. So I've been talking about trying to ship the minimal code down to your users. Um, code splitting is sort of one answer to this problem of, of serving people monolithic bundles. It's the idea that by defining split points in your code from sort of view to view, for example, or route to route, um, you can split them into different files that get lazy loaded on demand. That can improve your startup time and help you you know, to getting interactive much, much quicker. Now, with Webpack, there are two ways of doing this. Well, actually, there are quite a few ways. There's not just two ways. Uh, with Webpack 1, um, you can use require.insure in order to do that. Um, Webpack is going to take a look at anywhere you're using require insure and create sort of a, a chunk for you based on that. Um, that's how you define a split point. In Webpack 2, they currently use system.import. Uh, from the loader spec in order to accomplish the same thing. Um, I do believe Webpack are also sort of, they're a little bit future-facing, looking at what's, what else is happening in the, the loading space. But basically, these are, these are two ways to do code splitting. There are great articles that cover this in more, in more depth. Um, there are other ways that you can do code splitting as well. Uh, the bundle loader is another option. Um, if you don't like the pattern that you just saw on screen, um, you can actually use bundle loader and prefix the things that you want to require in to your page, and it will automatically wrap those things into a require.insure for you and take care of the rest. Um, it's also possible to sort of wait for that uh, chunk asynchronously um, before you do anything with the code. And finally, if you happen to be using React Router, it's actually got really great support for working with require.insure. So this is a declarative option. It's also got a slightly more imperative one. But basically, when I'm defining routes here, I'm able to use a, an asynchronous get component. Um, and inside there, I can say, well, go and please get me the user profile view. Um, and then I can go and do stuff with it. So it doesn't necessarily need to be included in a big monolithic bundle up front. The next thing is the purple pattern. So Sam talked about the purple pattern um, uh, yesterday. It's basically a pattern for structuring and serving progressive web apps with a, an emphasis. It's got a lot of emphasis on uh, performant app delivery, um, maybe looking at the ideas of how you can more granularly do things at a route level. But it focuses very heavily on um, giving you a minimum time to interactive. So the idea, here, the idea here is push the minimal functional code for a route, render that route, pre-cache the remaining routes, um, and lazy load routes on demand as needed. Uh, again, lots of nuance here. Um, but we do have a guide on that that you can go and check out. Now, with Webpack, it's possible to do something uh, a lot like purple uh, using require.insure or system.import with an async get component, uh, React Router. And uh, there are a few different options here. So Sam talked a little bit about uh, the differences between preload or, or H2 push. So let's unpack some of the ideas there. So link rel preload, uh, if you haven't used it before, it's basically a declarative fetch directive. In human terms, it's a way to tell the browser to start fetching a certain resource because you as an author knows that you're probably going to need it. Some people have done really interesting experiments here where they've used you know, stuff like their Google Analytics to decide you know, what routes should get preloaded based on the navigation paths of the user. Um, but with Webpack, you can use things like Asset Webpack plugin in order to wire up chunks that are generated at build time um, up to your markup. Uh, there's more you can read up about link rel preload. I, I believe Housing may have mentioned some of their experience with preload earlier today as well. 
If you're exploring HTTP2, uh, there's a really violently named plugin called, you know, ex aggressive splitting plugin. I'm not sure why it was called that. Um, but this is another option for basically um, going a little bit more granular with the chunks that you're shipping down to users. Um, uh, nuance, again, uh, different JavaScript engines might treat uh, the way that you split things up differently. There are going to be cases where, in fact, shipping a, a larger chunk will just mean that it's able to stream that JavaScript in and parse and compile it a little bit faster than you, you know, going and fetching yet another chunk. So know that this exists. Try it out if, you, if you're interested in the idea of H2 with Webpack. Um, but nuance, once again. Now, another uh, piece of interesting data that came back from my research is that code splitting itself does not solve everything. In fact, um, I just focused on the apps where people self-identified as saying they were code splitting. What I found was that they were interactive in 9.8 seconds. So definitely not where we thought they would be, right? We, we expect them to be a little bit closer to those Flipkart and housing.com numbers. Um, what I discovered after profiling them in slightly more depth was that a lot of folks were shipping down chunks for a route that were 600, 700, 800 kilobytes of script, in some cases 1.2 megs of script, and then they were lazy loading even more right after the fact for some crazy reason. Um, but this is something, you know, I, I don't entirely blame people for it because our current tooling doesn't do an amazing job of highlighting these issues. It doesn't really put performance in your face. So ask yourself what's in your bundle. I think that it, it's very, very easy for us these days to NPM install the entire world. It's very easy to include more modules than we necessarily need um, when we're shipping down uh, code for routes. But I thought that maybe it would be interesting for us to see what we could do about this at a Webpack level. So I put together an RFC for an idea I call Webpack Performance Budgets or Webpack Performance Insights. And Sean Larkin, who's in the audience over there, has actually been helping me with this. Um, and I thought that it would be interesting to, to give you guys a preview of what we think could be a better way of highlighting some of these performance um, issues earlier on in your development process. So here is what the output you'd normally get with Webpack looks like today. Um, I've got a build here where I've got, you know, I've got almost two megs of script in, in, two, of these, um, in two of these bundles. Um, and I have, as a user, if I'm not really that familiar with web performance, I don't know that there's an issue here that I need to solve. It should be obvious. And these numbers are quite large on purpose, but it, it should be something that you know maybe Webpack could, could tell me I have an issue. So we looked at implementing a proposal that I put together, and this is what it looks like. So you go and run Webpack on your project, and it includes this output for you. Let's, let's try to unbundle some of the ideas that are here. So the first thing it does is it tells you if you have particularly large chunks in your bundle. So you'll see at the very top, instead of just listing all of our different um, JavaScript output in green, it's highlighted in yellow chunks that are particularly large and cross a, a, a specific performance budget that's defined by Webpack as default. Um, if it notices that you're doing that, so in this case, um, I've actually customized this a little bit and said that the, the maximum size for a chunk is 100 kilobytes, it's going to tell you, you know, it's going to warn you and say, this is an issue. It also can highlight large entries. So trying to look at, you know, defining what budget are you crossing for an entire route or an entire view? Because you might easily have multiple chunks that compose something, and you don't want to be one of those people shipping down a meg of script if you don't need to. So large entry tracking is going to help you with that. And finally, at the moment in this, in this proof of concept that we've got, we also highlight patterns. So if we see somewhere where, you think, where we think you're going to benefit from doing something like using code splitting, using require.insure or system.import, we'll tell you about it. Um, now, again, this is, this is a very early proof of concept. We've just been hacking on it over the last couple of days. But I think that we have an opportunity to work together with tooling vendors like Webpack to try solving some of these performance issues together in a meaningful way that will hopefully end up giving users um, better time to inter interactivity scores. So something you might also be wondering once again is, you know, can I, can I configure this stuff? And yes, you absolutely can. Uh, using the performance object, you can actually set the maximum asset size, the maximum initial chunk size, and uh, turn on or off um, the idea of getting those hints. Uh, there's a preview available today that you can go and check out. Um, at this point, we're, you know, the, all of the UX you've seen, you, you might think that that's a really long report um, in your CLI. But we'd welcome people to try out you know, the proof of concept we've got today. And let us know if it helps. Let us know if you've got any feedback on the UX at all. 
I think that this is just the beginning. So uh, size alone is just one aspect um, when it comes to script loading performance. There's also things like you know, parse eval times, execution times, and so on. There are interesting opportunities for us to, to use this as a baseline for building up more tooling that then benefits all Webpack users. Um, I'd love to explore at some point in the future what things like code coverage could even, could even mean for these experiences. So that's our first preview. Um, please go check it out and let us know what you think. Now, um, another thing I wanted to recommend uh, is there, there's going to be a point where you're optimizing your, pro your progressive web app, and you're going to hit you know, a point where you can't optimize the size of React down any further. Um, and something that I found uh, is actually really great for just swapping in is Preact, which is a much smaller, it's almost a three kilobyte um, alternative to React with the same ES6 API. Uh, I believe Jason Miller, who worked on Preact, is in the audience, so thank you, Jason. Um, and a lot of the traces that I've done of Preact apps are showing them, like this is again, on a real device with a real network. They're interactive in under five seconds. Um, I, I was taking a look. So this is Source Map Explorer. Um, it's a sort of a nice, a little bit like the bundle analyzer tools that, that Sam was showing in his talk. Um, this, this gives you something very similar. So this is what my dependency graph looks like when I have React in place on the very right. So uh, lots of stuff going on. Um, when I switched over to using Preact and Preact Compat, this changed quite significantly. This is with almost the same API. Like I, I did run into one or two bugs, I will say that, and Jason kindly fixed them very, very quickly. Um, but this is definitely something that I consider, you know, if, if you're running into, you know, places where you, you've, you've, you've tried optimizing your app down, you're still finding a bottleneck, Preact is definitely worth checking out, um, especially if you care about your time to interactivity being small. Um, setting this up with Webpack is actually quite trivial. Um, you can use uh, Resolve aliases to map React to Preact Compat, React on to Preact Compat 2. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Now, in previous years, Jake has talked a lot about um, offline and the benefits that you get uh, from instant loading using Service Worker. And I'd like us to consider layering our apps so the network is an enhancement a little bit more. When you do this, you're able to actually give your users those almost instant experiences on repeat visit, and you just, you know, you, you crush your time's interactivity. Um, in this case, this is housing.com. On first visit on a 3G network um, on a real phone, uh, they're getting, you know, they're getting content on the screen in 3.5 seconds. On repeat visit, it's almost instant. It's in under a second. Um, and the amount of script and everything that they were trying to load up initially is no longer an issue. That's already cached using the Service Worker Cache API. And they're able to get interactive really quickly. So definitely something we're taking a look at. Uh, a lot of the time when we talk about progressive web apps, we talk about the application uh, shell model, uh, which is this idea of caching your shell and loading in content um, using JavaScript. There are many different variations of this pattern. Um, this isn't the only one. But if you're trying to get service worker caching in place, um, I highly recommend the SW Precache Webpack plugin. Um, so this will integrate with your Webpack build process. It will generate a service worker that precaches your static assets, like your application shell. Um, and it just generates a hash of all your file contents as well. Um, there's a lot of best practices for you out of the box. Um, we're checking out if, uh, you know, if you've tried vanilla service workers, found that there's, there's a little bit of boilerplate there, and you'd like a tool that just helps you with the rest of your workflow. Uh, Jeff is going to talk a little bit more about SW Precache um, and SW Toolbox in his talk. Now, another thing that Lighthouse um, tries to highlight is progressive enhancement. And I think that this is one of those this is one of those super contentious topics. Luckily, I'm on stage, so I can't look at Twitter in any shape or form uh, to see people's opinions on PE. But I do like this idea of supporting all of your target users using progressive enhancement um, and trying to target all the people that are in your market so that your app at least works for them. I think that progressive enhancement has sort of evolved over the last few years as we've gotten support for better primitives like Service Worker, so that you know instead of necessarily optimizing for people that have JavaScript disabled, you're optimizing for network resilience. So, you know, if you're using patterns like purple, and again, purple isn't, you know, the solution to everything. If you're using patterns like purple, you can end up shipping so so little code to your users to, to get them, them, them useful that, you know, maybe things like server-side rendering aren't necessarily as beneficial in those places or as necessary in those places that you might need them to be. However, um, as Flipkart are going to talk about a little bit later, there are still benefits to things like server-side rendering um, for SEO bots, and there are places where you might need to get content on the screen quicker. For those cases, uh, React supports uh, this idea of sort of server-side rendering or universal JavaScript rendering. Um, it also has a really good story around uh, things like universal data flow and data fetching. Uh, so 
React provides you uh, this, this method called render to string for rendering markup on the server um, as part of its story around universal JavaScript. Um, and it's this idea of like you, you ship down your HTML, you then hydrate as soon as React and all of the rest of your components um, have, have loaded up, uh, attaching event listeners and so on so that the person can actually interact with the app. Um, so React has got a good story around this. this. This stuff is actually not too difficult to get set up, um, as demonstrated by folks like Celio who are using server-side rendering with React. However, universal JavaScript has got issues. I don't think that this is something that's talked about enough in the community. I think it's something that we can probably share more data on, definitely. Um, it's very, very easy to get stuck in uncanny valley when you're server-side rendering, where your user is in a place where they're able to see content, they can tap around it, but they can't actually really do anything because they're still waiting on the rest of your JavaScript chunks and your, and your modules and so on to load up in order to attach those event handlers. Um, render to string has also got known issues around being synchronous, so it can affect things like your time to first byte. Um, streaming, server-side rendered React can actually help here, and I'd recommend checking out projects like React DOM stream. Um, re render to string can also monopolize the CPU um, and, and waste resources when it comes to re-rendering components. Um, component memoization can help there, so take a look at things like React SSR optimization, another project that tries to help with this stuff. But you know, don't don't consider things like universal JavaScript or, or server-side rendering with React as like you know a, a given solution that's going to be fast. It's very very important. Once again, consider there will be nuance here, and it's important to measure. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about any of the stuff that I've been talking about, I recently published um, a series of uh, articles called Progressive Web Apps with React, and you can go and check those out. But I'd like to invite to the stage um, Avanov, uh, who's going to talk about Flipkart's experience shipping uh, production progressive web apps with React at scale. Uh, thanks, Eddie. So I'm Abhinav Rastogi. I'm a developer on the web team that built Flipkart.com. I spent most of 2015 um, working on Flipkart Lite, uh, a cutting edge mobile progressive web app. Uh, that some of you may have heard about uh, in the recent times. And this year, I've been uh, working mostly leading the team, uh, bringing that PWA goodness to the desktop side. So Flipkart, let me introduce you to it. Uh, Flipkart is the largest e-commerce site uh, and a first class. It's the largest e-commerce site in India and a first class progressive web app across all form factors uh, and browsers. And by that, I mean across mobile and desktop. We've got the opportunity uh, to showcase our new mobile website uh, at CDS Chrome Dev Summit last year. And this is what it looks like now uh, on the side. And it's virtual, virtually indistinguishable uh, from our native app, uh, both feature and design-wise. So uh, Alex uh, tweeted this today morning uh, that for all of us coming from desktop to mobile, a change in outlook is crucial. Uh, mobile is much less forgiving. And I wholeheartedly agree with this. Luckily for us, uh, we were going from mobile to desktop. So we carried our learnings along, and this is what our desktop site looks like now. So let me go over quickly uh, the kind of technologies that we are using uh, to build this. Uh, at a very high level, uh, we are using a combination of React, React Router, Flux, Redux on mobile and desktop respectively, and a Webpack to bundle all together, along with a bunch of other technologies that help us build this and sort of um, put, pack it together. So that includes like think ES6 and the latest JavaScript technologies, fetch promises, and Node on the back end. So let me talk a bit about the architecture. At a very high level, uh, both mobile and desktop sites uh, for us uh, have a very similar architecture. Let's see what that is. Uh, a, uh, we use route-based closed code, code splitting on both. Uh, we have a smart preloading of chunks, and we implement the concept of purple, which we have heard about. Uh, we have partial server-side rendering and a concept of build-time rendering uh, on each, and we have, obviously, service workers for caching different kind of resources. But an important thing to keep in mind um, is that the implementations for us are different based on the requirements. There are significant differences on how you treat, uh, how you need to treat mobile and desktop users. The requirements are different, the user behaviors are definitely different, uh, the attention spans are different, Network conditions are definitely different. Uh, your mobile will have, can have a flaky network, 2G or 3G. Desktops tend to have a more stable and a faster connection. Device capabilities are very different, as Alex mentioned yesterday. And browser fragmentation, of course, and distribution. Uh, for example, in India, um, the browser distribution 
on mobile is such that uh, UC browser takes a fair chunk of the pie, a majority chunk. Uh, but on desktop, it's the latest version of Chrome which takes a majority chunk. So how you treat development and which one you target first and you add, like, you know, you have to take the least common denominator. You solve for the one which is probably going to cause you the most problems and you build up on top of that, supporting more and more features, tre treating things like network and, you know, access CPU, things like that as a progressive enhancement. So let us look at uh, the differences in implementation, like I pointed out. On the mobile site, uh, we have a concept of build time rendering, which essentially means that we build the app shells out of our code and uh, we create static HTML files, which we serve uh, to the user when we get a request. So there is no request time processing needed. It's a simple file. We have a service worker in place which caches that shell and obviously after that it can work offline first. And for our mobile site, it's a composition of multiple single page apps, which I will talk about in a bit. On the other side, on the desktop, uh, we have partial server side rendering. Uh, that means we try to optimize what content needs to be rendered on the server. We don't have a concept of build time rendering. And we don't have a concept of app shells. Now, the reason for this is simply user's requirement and the user experience. I feel, and that's what we feel at Flipkart, that um, the user experience of an app shell can work really well on a mobile device where you can show a header, a footer, and a loader maybe, um, and some content. But uh, on a desktop, showing just a header and a loader still leaves you with a pretty big blank page. It's not a very good experience. So therefore, we went for a partial server-side rendering approach. Apart from that, we have a chunk response uh, for our first request, uh, the HTTP response, which allows us to achieve a faster time to first paint. I will explain that in a bit. And we use uh, server-side, uh, we use uh, service workers for caching uh, the um, things like data and resources, like images and things like that. So here is the output from a Webpack build. Uh, Webpack supports code splitting out of the box, like Addy was just mentioning, and it figures out the split points based on how you include your components. It also takes care of loading the appropriate chunk when needed, example, when it's you nav navigate. The benefit here is that you significantly, you have significantly reduced the amount of JavaScript that you need to render the first, the first fold of your page. Like for example, uh, what I, the screenshot that I've put up here, the, com the combined build that we had uh, for our website at some point of time was around 206 kilobytes. With code splitting based on routes, we were able to split it. For example, home page only needed 32 kilobytes of JavaScript to render. And similarly, other pages needed anything from 7 kilobytes to 100 kilobytes. This really helps a lot. But there is an important caveat here. As I said, Webpack loads the, out of the box, Webpack will try to load these files on navigation. When the route changes, it figures out, OK, this route is this, JavaScript is not present. And it has a map somewhere which tells it, OK, load this JavaScript file which means it is downloading, evaluating, and parsing that JavaScript after you have clicked on a link, which is a very bad user experience. So to solve that, uh, Purple comes to the rescue. Implementing these concepts of chunking, streaming, uh, and code splitting, you get a picture which looks like this. The first one at the top is what you see uh, before all these improvements for us. So you've got your HTML parsing in blue at the top, and all your static resources and JavaScript, CSS starts loading when the HTML is parsed. And uh, you get a render time of around 2,500 milliseconds and a page complete around, a DOM complete around 3,500. With these uh, uh, optimizations in place, uh, you get a first point of around one, milli uh, one second uh, with you know, uh, your resources loading in parallel to the parse of your HTML. This is achieved using things like preload, script defer, and uh, similar things. But uh, this only solves for first paint. Uh, what about time to interactive and meaningful content? So we think uh, that your entire content doesn't need to be rendered together for it to be meaningful. For example, what we do is uh, we, our first paint, our first render that we put on the uh, user's page contains the search box and it's, it functions without any JavaScript, which means that the user is able to interact with the plain HTML that we serve to him, which gets rendered even before any JavaScript has started downloading. Since most of our users, a lot of our users start their journey uh, by searching and not just navigating and you know, uh, looking for products on that page, uh, this really helps us a lot. So some major wins for us that we have seen when we did this migration, this uh, adoption of um, you know, progressive web app concepts on desktop and mobile both, 
is that route-based code splitting amortizes the high cost that you have of single-page apps and frameworks over the session of the user. You don't load all the JavaScript up front, you load it across the session. Similarly, smart preloading of those chunks and using the purple concepts makes the experience seamless. User doesn't have to wait uh, after clicking on a link for the JavaScript to load. Thirdly, chunked encoding allows us to download JS chunks while HTML is still being parsed. An interesting uh, approach we took was that based on the user requirements that we figured made sense uh, for users in India, we solved for uh, repeat visits on mobile specifically and for first visit on desktop. Of course, we care about both on both the platforms, but you, we decided to focus on one over the other. Let me talk about the impact now. So uh, up to 2x conversion uh, during sale events after we uh, migrated to these because of the high speed and reliability and the benefits we have talked about of progressive web apps, we have a significantly reduced bounce rate. Interestingly, um, you know, a lot of people have seen concerns around search engine optimization, you know, how, what, how will the crawler crawl the website, what's the impact on SEO. After doing all this, uh, we have seen a 50% reduction in time taken by the search, the search engines to crawl our page and a 50% increase in the number of pages that are crawled by Google search. That's significant improvement. Apart from that, we have also seen a massive 70% reduction in the tickets that are raised, the issues that we get on the website. There are lesser errors in general. Plus, it's much easier and faster to develop, and it's more developer friendly to, my, uh, to get new developers on board, fix those errors for us to maintain. Of course, there are a bunch of gotchas. Webpack has been a super useful tool for us. Uh, that's what we use, as I mentioned. And its documentation is going through some very well-deserved improvements. So working with PRPL uh, and code splitting, you are bound to run into a bunch of uh, you know, interesting issues. And Webpack does provide a lot of help to solve them, but some of it is buried really deep in the documentation. You have to really search for it. And mostly you find the answer on Stack Overflow before you find it in the docs. So the first issue we ran into was uh, cross-origin resource sharing and route-based uh, code splitting. So an interesting thing that happens is, which might be true for a lot of us here, our JavaScript files and static assets generally are served from a CDN which is on a different origin uh, as compared to your website. Now when you do a link preload, you can tell it to uh, load it as, uh, as a script and you can tell it to load it from a different origin, it's cross-origin, anonymous. And uh, similarly, um, when you, anyway, so you can define uh, that it's loading as a cross-origin resource. But when Webpack tries to load a script, um, like we mentioned, uh, based on the chunks, when it sees it needs a new JavaScript, it will by default not load it as a cross-origin script and your browser may end up blocking it, uh, which causes quite a lot of headaches. So interestingly, it does provide a, uh, uh, attribute or uh, you know a config that you can specify which makes webpack load those chunks as a cross origin script it takes care of that internally a second one was as we know a cache invalidation is a very big problem apart from naming variables uh, that when you create a chunk right and usually uh, for long term caching purposes the name of the chunk the file name usually will contain the hash right uh, that's how you determine whether this file is a new version of an, like if the content is new. So now what happens is uh, that uh, when Webpack creates these chunks, it needs to maintain a lookup table that in your entry chunk, which is loaded at your page load, it needs to know that when this route is opened, this is the JavaScript file it needs to download. Now that URL, that file is going to change at some point of time. So for example, you have route-based chunks, like I mentioned before, you have these 15 routes on your website and you have those 15 JavaScript files correspondingly. As each uh, file is, suppose one of them changes, as suppose you make change on one, like a product details page. Uh, ideally, only that one JavaScript file, that chunk should get invalidated in the cache. Only that should be needed for the user to download again. Others should still be served from Service Worker or you know, the HTTP cache. What happens is because that chunk has changed, its file name has changed, the manifest in the, the uh, lookup table in the Webpack's entry chunk will also change, which means the entry chunk will change, which means the user ends up downloading extra JavaScript, which has not actually changed. 
So for that, uh, Webpack provides a thing called the Webpack manifest. Uh, it's pretty simple. In the Commerce Chunk plugin, you just define the name for the manifest, and you uh, end up with a separate file, like 500 bytes or something, which will just have that lookup table. And all your other, your entry chunk becomes independent of the content of your other chunks. So it's these kind of small things which, you know, uh, we ran into, and a lot of you may run into uh, when you are implementing these kind of things. So what's next for us at Flipkart is making things faster. So we are looking into things like HTTP2 uh, for enabling push of these resources smartly. We are also working on AMP uh, to make the first visit faster. So that's all from my side. Um, you can reach out to me on this Twitter handle or my team at Flipkart underscore tech. It's great to be here. Thank you. So I've got one more thing. So I'd like to tell you a quick story. I don't have a lot of time, but I'd like to tell you a quick story about a small group of us got to write some code for NASA. Um, so a while back, a few years ago, uh, NASA released a master list of software projects they've cooked up over the last couple of years. Um, this is more stuff than you just run on your personal computer. It's like you know, uh, apps that would help with robotics and cryogenic systems and space uh, simulations and all sorts of things. And they had these in a bunch of different places, uh, GitHub, GitLab, SourceForge. It was all over the place. But it was just part of like the government initiative to try open sourcing more stuff. And it was kind of neat to see. So, off the back of that, NASA released um, a site called code.nasa.gov that looked a little bit like this. Um, the, the idea here was that at any time you could come to the site and you could take a look um, at you know, what, what NASA engineers were, were hacking on um, in the open, which is kind of cool. But uh, I discovered this on Hacker News one day, and my friend Sam Sacconi also discovered it around the same time. And we tried looking at this on a real device, um, and it basically crashed my phone. What happened was we ended up you know, profiling this a little bit, and there were a number of interesting uh, quirks with this particular implementation. Uh, it came, kept the main thread pegged for quite a long time. Uh, in fact, we, we ended up uh, working on a number of performance audits. There's actually a performance audit I, I'll be publishing uh, shortly on this whole thing. But uh, we ended up uh, trying to make this, this existing implementation as fast as we could. Uh, we, this was a sort of an Angular one app, and, and at that time, you know, that framework wasn't really built with real mobile devices in mind um, at the time, and, and we ran into all these interesting issues, like uh, digest cycles taking up to a second. Uh, this particular app had 10,000 watchers for some reason. Uh, they had uh, they, they had like a GitHub embed uh, for every single entry, so they had like three or four hundred projects listed on this page, and they had a GitHub embed for every single one, so that you could go and fork the project. So that was like an additional three or four hundred network requests for for lulls. Um, they also had like a ton of web fonts and other other interesting issues here that um, uh, I don't I don't think um, is entirely you know the not atypical of, of something that you know if 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 you were new to this stuff you probably run into some of these these similar problems. Um, and so we, we, we started optimizing this as much as we could, but we reached a point where, you know, we thought this, this just isn't worth it. It's probably worth taking a look at rewriting this thing. Um, and I know that today I've been talking, you know, we've been talking quite a lot about React and, and Preact and other libraries. Um, but uh, I like this idea of, of best practices being automated. Um, I think that some of the ideas we've talked about today around purple and code splitting and so on are things that we can do a better job of building in by default into today's tooling. I'd love to get to a point where things like Create React App and Angular CLI and Ember CLI and so on, um, Next.js, whatever it is that you happen to be using, um, are, are considering some of these approaches and looking at where they can you know, provide real uh, improvements to, to developers uh, so that we balance developer experience with user experience. So. Uh, Polymer does this kind of well with the Polymer app toolbox. I consider it a good reference for how to do this stuff. It's got, you know, Sam, Sam and I think Taylor mentioned some of this stuff. So it's got purple with code splitting built in and lazy loading and offline caching and support for H2 server push. Um, but using the Polymer app toolbox uh, allowed us to um, actually ship a completely brand new version of code.nasa.gov. This is NASA's very first progressive web app that we deployed last night. Um, so thank you. 
I've got to give big props to Frankie over on the Polymer team and Keanu, uh, Hannah Lee, and all the folks that helped us uh, get this shipped. But basically, everything here is faster. Uh, here we were looking up sort of, you know, as you would code for the Apollo 11 mission from all those years ago, uh, looking up ways in which, you know, NASA would publish projects or, or even share um, projects with other people. Uh, all of these views on a real mobile device perform really well. Um, it's a massive improvement from what they had before. Uh, we spent a lot of time on things like making sure that the infinite scrolling um, for their project list view was really, really fast, so hitting 60 frames a second. Um, and this experience works really great on sort of desktop as well. So uh, the experience there is, is, again, it's responsive. We can see the, the, the list there and, and actually being able to search things really, really quickly. There's, there's no lag. Um, in place, but um, all of the views work just as well there, just showing you a slightly different look and feel to this thing. But um, we profiled this using Lighthouse on a real device with a real network, and this thing was interactive in under four seconds, so under 4,000 milliseconds. Um, we were really happy with that because we actually spent less than a week redoing this site. It's not a complex site. Um, by any means, but the idea that you could, you know, completely throw away an old code base and try exploring something like a purple pattern in such a short amount of time with a very small team was, I thought, kind of cool. Um, so we really enjoyed uh, hacking with NASA on that site, um, and I encourage you to contribute uh, to, you know, code.nasa.gov. If you know, just being able to tell your mom that you hacked on NASA code is kind of neat. So <laughs> that's always an opportunity. Um, but it's all open source. This entire app is open source. Um, you can go and check it out on NASA's uh, GitHub organization, so github.com slash nasa slash code dash nasa dash gov. Um, I am certain we will get pull requests from folks mentioning things we've done wrong, but I welcome all of those. Uh, so please feel free to, you know, check that out. Let us know if there's anything we can improve. Um, in closing, I, I hope that, you know, some of the ideas in this talk uh, give us inspiration to perf the web forward together, uh, because we're all in this together. I see browser vendors as being in a good place to tell you about the engine and the performance targets we should be hitting. Um, I see framework authors and tooling vendors as being people that you know, ideally want to make sure that developers are able to ship the right experiences that benefit their users and, and the experiences you're shipping for your users. So let's work together. Um, I would love, you know, if you're, if you're working on any of this stuff, please talk to me. Please talk to us. Uh, and let's, you know, let's move things forward together. Thank you.